Welcome to your Masters in Digital Marketing and Social Media with Aspire Business School. This module is on digital business and your first class will be an introduction to the digital environment. If you look back at how digital has developed over the years, what significance did 2018 have on the digital yearbook? We saw that Digital media, social media and mobile use was used in every country in the world. We can dig down into some statistics now. So in 2018, we had over seven and a half billion people on the planet. 55% of those were actually living in urban areas. Of those people, over four billion of them were using the internet. Three billion were active social media users. 5 billion were unique mobile users, and we had almost 3 billion active social media users on their mobiles. Now, when we look at the numbers in terms of growth, we can see that in 2018, the users of the internet grew by 7% compared to the year before. The users that are active on social media grew by 13% compared to 2017. The unique mobile users went up by 4% and active mobile social users went up by 14%. What these numbers tell us is that going digital and going social and digital is an increasing trend. And I imagine if we look at the numbers at the end of this year, they will have increased even more. What implications that have on businesses that are using digital to grow? What do they have to take into account when they innovate and what do entrepreneurs need to think about when they look at new products and services for their companies? If we take some statistics from SimilarWeb and Alexa, we can see that the websites that had the most traffic in 2018 were Google, then Facebook, and then YouTube. But according to Alexa, when they rank the sites based on the number of daily visitors and page views, Google still comes out on top but then YouTube outranks Facebook. Why do you think that is? Why is it that Facebook has more total traffic, but YouTube has more daily visitors and page views? What is the difference between the services they provide that means their ranking is different depending on how you look at it? And when we look at language, even though internet users exist in every country in the world, in the majority, over half of the websites are actually written in English. And when you look at the difference in language, actually the other languages fall far behind quite dramatically. So whilst 51.2% of websites are in English, only 6.8% are in Russian, and that's the second language on the ranking. And this is largely because the international language of business is English and we all have to communicate in the universal way. We took some information from We Are Social in terms of their analysis of what the future of digital is. And they say that because the adoption of the internet is accelerating so quickly, this really has some critical implications for the future of the internet. Companies like Google, Facebook, and Alibaba will aim to create products and services that are globally scalable, and who actually meet the needs of not just our existing customers, but their next billion users. So what we as users can expect is that every aspect of our digital experience will be evolving in the coming months and years. We Are Social suggests that video will be on the increase and actually audiovisual content will be more accessible and that they'll be available in more different languages. That instead of using our keyboards to type, we will actually input commands into our devices using our voice. Now, currently Apple is doing that with Siri, but that's because you have to use an app to ask Siri a question. But in the future, we will replace tapping the keyboard with our voice. We are social also predict that we will increasingly use images to search rather than just text. They even suggest that we'll use videos to search as well. 
Now, currently, the most popular search engine is Google. And if you want to use an image to search on Google, you have to go onto Google Images. But in the future, we are socially suggesting that we will use images and video across all digital platforms. They also suggest that URLs will evolve to cater to lower levels of literacy, as well as shifting to voice control instead of typing. So you can see a pattern in what we are social predict for the future. Images, video, and voice to replace text and typing. With more than 4 billion people using the internet for an average of six hours a day, digital, digital actually has actually become a very essential part of everyday life. We are using connectivity in every part of our life. We're chatting with friends, we're playing games, we're researching products, we're tracking our health, we're finding love, we're making payments, we're buying things. And actually what brands need to do is they have to go beyond what they're doing today and actually build digital into the seamless customer experience because this is what their actual customers are doing right now. And what we as social suggest we do as businesses in order to achieve that is to actually start with asking people what they want. We don't just want to create a techie solution for the sake of having a smart tech solution, but actually is this solution catering for the needs and wants of our customers and our audience? They also suggest that when you're creating innovation, when you're creating new products and services, that you actually create on, on cre you actually focus on creating mutual value and not just creating something for the sake of making money, because it's value that will keep your business sustainable. They also suggest that you make it as easy as possible for people to buy online wherever they are in the world, and to harness digital tools to keep the conversation going. So this means that even when a person has bought something from you, that you keep communicating with them using digital to prolong not only the relationship, but the value that you're adding to this person's life. If you compare how people interacted with digital in 2015 compared to 2013, we can see that in this picture, the difference is quite startling. In, in, in 2005, People experienced life with their bodies, with their eyes. They captured things with their phone, maybe, but their phone was mainly used for sending text messages and making phone calls. Remember those? But in 2013, we experienced life through our smartphones, through media, through technology. So we might be at a football game, we might be at a concert, we might be at a rally, and we are experiencing this event both with our eyes but actually also with our device we'll take pictures we'll make videos we might in the future even be playing games at the same time so technology is almost like an extension of our hand let's look at some definitions of entrepreneurship and innovation which are one of the basics of digital development so entrepreneurship is seen as a shift of economic resources out of an area of lower to higher productivity of greater yield. That was a definition made in 1800. Do you think it's changed? And innovation is creating value out of existing resources. Innovation is a specific tool of entrepreneurship and actually entrepreneurship and innova innovation go hand in hand. And in this module, we'll see why. Innovation is seen as being disruptive, ideas-driven, creative. It's meant to involve people. It's important. It's founded in companies. But when you look at the open innovation paradigm, you'll see that in companies will use technology at the base, technology internally, and technology externally. We will insource technology and outsource it as well. We'll use it to infiltrate the market of other firms, create a new market, and actually develop our existing market. So technology and innovation are important because they allow you as a company to create new markets for yourself and take advantage of the markets you're already in. Entrepreneurship is also seen as destroying old order and creating something new. And innovation effectively is creating value from existing processes and things, not just having to create new things. So it's not about creating something brand new, creating a product or service that nobody's ever seen or experienced before. It's actually about creating new value. 
So you could have the same product, the same service, but it's pitched in a different way, it's presented in a different way, or it's changed in a way that actually adds more value to the lives of your customers. We're gonna look now into three types of, of innovation. We're gonna look into technical innovation, social innovation, and economic innovation. And it's true to say that most innovations are social and economic because they have the most impact. Let's take a look at social innovations for the moment. So social innovations are things that are created of value that affect us in our social environments and our social worlds. So these are things like educational facilities, like night schools, adult schools, universities, hospitals. What innovation do you think is happening in hospitals? What different treatments are being created? What ways of serving patients and their families are being thought out? And why would night schools or adult schools be innovative? They're innovative because they allow working adults to use their spare time to actually get an education and further themselves professionally. So social innovations are those that make a big social impact, an impact on our social existence. Technological innovations are those innovations, those experiences, those inventions that use technology to make our lives better, more efficient, more effective. If you think about the device that you're using now to experience this module, you might be using a smartphone, that used to be a phone that you held in your hand, plugged in a number, made a phone call or sent, sent a text message. It didn't do anything more than that. Now, on your smartphone, you can take everything on your desktop in your smartphone. You can use it to buy things, to keep in contact with people, to make video calls, to show people where you are. You can play games on it. You can do all your banking on it. You can check what your, what, what, where your money is going. You can book a flight. You can buy a house. You can do anything that you want using your smartphone. That's a huge innovation that's made our lives much easier, but also created a lot of problems when you think of social media. Technology also allows us to get to places faster, to make our processes and systems more efficient, so technological innovations are important because they help us move forward, but we have to socially learn how to manage them. What are the main char characteristics of innovation? Innovation is very systematic and it's hard work. It's systematic because you have to go through different phases in order to innovate a product or service. And it's hard work because if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Innovation focuses on opportunities, not problems. Now, certainly some innovations arise because you want to solve the problem of a customer, but the, the solution to a problem is an opportunity itself. It's, it's an opportunity to connect with your customer. It's an opportunity to create something new, to take over a market, to give you a leading edge compared to your competitors. And in that way, innovation is very focused because you allow yourself to only change one thing at one time to make sure that it's effective. Innovation, of course, is customer centric. So your customer is always at the center of the innovation that you're making. Otherwise, why are you doing it? And your customer can be somebody who's going to pay for a product or service. Your customer can be your employee. Your customer could be your supplier. So your customer isn't necessarily just the person that pays you money to buy something from you. And when innovation is done well, the effects of it is felt economically and socially. Companies will practice innovation in certain ways. Firstly, they see that they have a responsibility for innovation. So when you think of a multinational, multinationals typically will have an arm of their business that is isolated and purely focused on innovation. They'll, they'll see it as a small business within their larger business. And this small business will find its own funding, will have its own people, will have its own focus and will create innovative products that will then be absorbed into the larger organizations. They have a responsibility for innovation. They also reward their innovators. So those that come up with the new ideas, that implement the new systems and processes and solutions are rewarded because innovation is the future of the company. 
They will then sometimes divisionalize, okay? They will create an entire division, as I mentioned earlier, for innovation. And they will change the rules of their corporate land in order to nurture innovation more. So they, the smart companies realize that innovation is the future. Johnson & Johnson is likely a company you've heard of because you use their products. Johnson & Johnson are an example of a great innovative company because they create new products, services, and experiences that their customers need. Their target is to make sure that for anything related to health and wellness, we choose their products. So they will make everything from medicines to shampoo. They also have a nonprofit arm that means they're actually using some of their profits to give back to society. So their impact is felt both economically and socially. Skunk Works at Lockhead is a company that's focused on serving the US military organizations. So in US defense, they will create new crafts in order to have a competitive edge against those people that they are fighting, okay? So they find ways to make aircrafts lighter, faster, quieter, and more targeted. And they also have prototypes they will use in order to investigate what's the best next new product we need to release to protect our country or their country. So when it comes to entrepreneurship, you'll need to understand how exactly does a, does a company earn? What's the business model that it uses? So it starts with the target customer their offering and how they're different. So who are we actually appealing to? What are we offering them? And what are we offering that is different to what other people in our existing market do? So our competitors, how do we differentiate ourselves from our competitors? That is what they call a customer value proposition. This is then plugged into key resources. So what key resources do we need to bring this customer value proposition to life? Who needs to be involved? What equipment are we using? What technology? What information? In the business, you also then have key processes, things like designing and manufacturing the product, ser ser servicing the customer, delivering the product, hiring people, marketing the product. And you feed all that into a revenue model where you look at what does it cost to make this product or service come to life in terms of our materials, our resources, and our labor costs. What margin do we then put on top of that? And eventually what revenue and profit will be making? So how can we project our earnings into the future? So that is how a company in a very simple way earns through innovation. So innovation actually is investment, sorry, an in invention that is paired with a process and a market. So you create a product or service, that's your invention. It doesn't necessarily have to be something brand new. It could be a spin on something existing, but you're inventing something. Then you have a process of actually bringing it to market. So you're producing it, you are distributing it, you have a financial processes, sales processes, development processes, customer service processes that actually bring the product or service to market. And you also have to have an existing market that will want to buy this product or you've created a new market for your product. One definition of entrepreneurship from Professor Howard Stevenson is the pursuit of opportunity beyond the resources one currently has under control. What do you think that means? What it means is you have existing resources, technology, your knowledge, your connections, and then you start to pursue opportunities beyond that. So you use where you are to find a new place to go, and that is entrepreneurship. Now, what entrepreneurship is not is small businesses or single person businesses for example, some people may open a restaurant and think they're an entrepreneur. A restaurant is not entrepreneurship. A restaurant is an activity. Now that we've said that, what is entrepreneurship? Entrepreneurship isn't a personality trait. It's actually the systematic search for change, to respond to that change and exploit the change as an opportunity. 
is systematic innovation is purple purposeful and organized search for changes and the systematic analysis of opportunities that these changes might offer for social and economic innovation. So for example, McDonald's is a restaurant chain, okay? When they are innovating, they will create new standards of their training, they will create new processes, they will create a new customer experience, they will create a new spin on the existing product. So if you remember back when McDonald's had decided to introduce salads in addition to burgers, that was innovation for McDonald's because they weren't known as a company or a restaurant you go to to eat a salad. But because they knew the market was changing, people were becoming more health conscious, they introduced salads to their menu as part of an innovative solution. After the Second World War, private and metropolitan universities came into play. These were innovative because they replaced the idea of standardized universities and they were actually aimed at people mid-career. So rather than taking on university students from the upper class, they offered mid-career individuals from the middle class an education. They were innovative because they took an old standard well-recognized product and service, and they put a new spin on it and created a new market for it. Entrepreneurship is a gap between technology and opportunity and value. Okay, so you may have a, an idea for a new product that is technology focused. It's an opportunity for you to either service an existing market or create a new market. You're adding value, but how do you get there? How do you get to your market? That through entrepreneurship. Let's now have a look at the do's and don'ts of innovation. So what do you do? Do you make innovation purposeful, systematic, and analyze your opportunities? You have to make it both a concept and a perception. It has to be very simple and focused, and that makes it effective. But to make yourself or your product or service innovative, you have to start small. And real successful innovation actually aims at leadership. And that's not just leadership of people, but it's thought leadership, it's leadership of a market. When you're innov innovating, don't try to diversify too quickly, try too many two things at once and trying to be too clever. Don't try to innovate for the future, innovate for the present. What does that mean? It means that when you have an idea for a product or service, serve the market where they are right now, where, not where you think they'll be. Because even if they think they know where they'll be, they don't, because that's not reality. Reality is right now. To succeed as an innovator, you have to understand what your strengths are first and build on those. And understand that for innovation to work, first of all, it is work. And secondly, it has an effect on the economy and on society. So let's have a look at the entrepreneurial process. First, you have to identify the opportunity. What is the need of the market? What is the solution you're bringing to that market? And what unfair advantage do you have? The unfair advantage being, what do you do differently? to your competitors that will make people in that market come to you and not go to your competitors. Then you match that with the resources that you have. So you need to get the right to the technology, you need to have the right people, and you need investment. Let's take a closer look now at what technology entrepreneurship is. It's actually both about the what you do and when you do it, okay? You start with the technical innovation, invention itself. So what is it that you've invented? You create the company that is going to bring that invention to market. You then create the business that will manage that product into market and all its customers. And then you go into administration. So companies up and running, you're no longer specifically innovative, but you, but you are running a technology company. So the zone of collaboration is when business creation goes into business administration. And the zone of competition 
is when business administration is happening. So your business is up and running, you are now actively competing in the market. Let's look at two different types of innovation. The first innovation is inside out innovation, and the second is outside in innovation. Okay, so these are the two broad types of innovation, but within them, there are five different types each. Okay, so you could have innovation in processes, so how a company organizes and supports itself. What core processes does it have that add value? How can you innovate those? How can you change them to make the business more effective? You could innovate in your offering as a business. So in terms of the product or service or performance, how can you change that to enhance it and give your customer a better experience? What about the servicing system? How can you extend or evolve the system that surrounds your offering to give your customer more value? And then of course, when you're offering this customer service, how do you currently service your customers? So for example, if the only way your customers can be in touch with you is through social media, through email, or through the phone. Perhaps you want to add a chat box to your website. That's innovation. It gives your customer a new experience, potentially a higher value experience, especially if they're not on social media. So that's inside out innovation. So what's outside in innovation? It falls into two categories, delivery and finance. In delivery, you'll talk about the channel. So how do you connect your offerings to your customers? How do they actually how do you deliver your products or service? Are you physically delivering it? Are you going through social media? How is a customer actually receiving your product or service? Then you can be innovative in your brand. So how do you express your, the benefits of your offering to your customer? How do your customers experience you? What do they think about you? Could you innovate your brand? If you think about a brand that's changed its image over the years, what comes to mind? We used the example of McDonald's earlier. Their branding changed when they decided to have a more healthy outlook. That's one way they innovated. And what about the customer experience? How do you create the overall experience for your customers and how can you innovate on that? How can you make it, how can you make it change or how can you make it better? And then in terms of finance, look at your business model. How do you currently make money and what can you change to make more or make money faster or exceed your revenue targets? Do you have to change your price point? Do you have to innovate in terms of the business model that you use? Do you change how you price? And what about your value network? The value chain and the enterprise structure, what can you innovate there to add more value? On this screen, you can see some examples of how companies have innovated using the 10 different types of innovation. You might have a look at something like Virgin, who changed their brand to appeal to different customers. You might look at a company like Lexus that will create more luxury experiences for its customers. You might look at a company like GE Capital that often changes its core processes in order to add more value to its customer base. FedEx will change how they service their customers. They'll deliver faster, they'll deliver to more countries. They'll, they'll give a better experience to people that have moved abroad that experience FedEx in their home countries. Microsoft Office changes their products all the time, their system, okay, when you add an upgrade, they're innovating, they're making your system better. How can you create and add value to your offerings? Walmart is an American chain that continues to grow profitably through core process innovations such as on-time delivery, inventory management systems, aggressive volume and pricing and delivery contracts with their providers, and systems that give their store managers the ability to identify changing buyers' behavior and respond quickly with new pricing and merchandising configurations. So they are focused on providing the best pricing in the market, and they have systems and processes around this so they can respond to the market needs quicker. 
What about creating new offerings? Nike ID is a service provided by Nike, allowing customers to personalize and design their own Nike merchandise. They offer this service online as well as in the physical Nike ID studios. So this actually is innovative because people who will wear the Nike merchandise, they like to be individual and Nike recognized this. And so they created a new arm of Nike that would allow their customers to be as individual as they wanted to be. How do you create new offerings? An example from Procter & Gamble. So Connect and Develop is a Procter & Gamble innovation strategy, and they actually partner with external companies to accelerate innovation, and that's applied across the company. So they will, they will partner with many different product providers and will create a better product for their own customers. What about designing your core offerings? So Lexus had a focus on performance factor in their cars and how quiet the engine is. And actually they decided that they would actually change the shape of the car in order to make it quieter, even though it was going on full throttle. And they knew this because the luxury experience is exactly what their customers are looking for. So they innovated in response to the requirements of their customers. FedEx, who are focused on on-time efficient and fast delivery, learned that which of their customers' actions led to failed or delayed deliveries. And they translated this data into simplicity in forms, packing and online interfaces to make it easy as possible for customers to use their service. So as well as delivering faster and more efficiently, they actually made it a better customer experience because as a result, the customer felt more in control. Microsoft Office actually links their platform with multiple products. So they build a variety of specific products like Word, Excel, PowerPoint, into a system designed to deliver productivity in the workplace. So Microsoft Office has an entire suite to offer to businesses and to individuals. So you don't have to go anywhere else for any of your computing needs. Lego is a brand that most children recognize, but they can actually, they've been created since 1958 and they've been innovating over the times. So whereas back in the 50s, they would have yellow um, Lego blocks that fit together and kids would just build what they wanted. Now Lego will align itself with movies and uh, pop culture in order to make their products more innovative and still more attractive to the market, but they're still building blocks that stick together. Nike are a great example of adding value to your customers and your consumers beyond your products. They develop many services around their shoes. So they have smart watches, they have um, pace counters, they have little devices that help you measure the calories that you've burned, and the actual product becomes a service. It's not just a shoes that you a shoes that you wear to go running or exercising in, but there are also other products you wear in order to monitor your health. So it becomes a service as well as a product. Ryanair are an airline that actually try to offer more experiences around their product. Their product is a flight going from A to B in an aeroplane, but they will give you money off. They will try and have super friendly um, staff on board. They will sell food and other goods on board at a discount. They will allow you to enter competitions. They will create package holidays all around this niche product of going from A to B in an airplane. Virgin is a company that is very good at marketing itself. It's one that has so many different brands, but every brand you interact with, you know, without a doubt, it's a Virgin brand because of how the company brands itself and markets itself to its customer base. 
And it's the reason why it's been enduring for so long, because they're very good at branding. Harley Davidson has created a worldwide community of millions of customers, many of them who describe being a Harley Davidson owner as part of how they fundamentally see, think, and feel about themselves. So when you can create a brand that a customer attaches to their identity, you know that you are creating a very powerful brand. So when you're innovating, how do you think about how your customers feel when they interact with your products and services? Because essentially, Harley Davidson sell motorbikes, but as well as selling motorbikes, they created an entire identity, a brand identity around it that people feel very attracted to. How about innovation on how you make money? Dell have revolutionized the PC business by taking money before the customer's PC was actually assembled and shipped, which actually gave them a lot, a lot more of a competitive edge financially over other similar companies. So they don't actually sell any Dell computers in store. All of their sales are online because they want you to buy something before you physically receive it. How about pairing with other companies for mutual benefit? So Apple doesn't just sell phones. It partners with app developers and music makers to actually sell music on their Apple store. They'll sell third-party applications for their iPhones and iPads, and they can sell music, other people's music, through iTunes. They also sell audiobooks, TV shows, and movies. So they partner with organizations that they know their customers are involved in to make a lot of money. So how can you become the next Google or Facebook or Microsoft? It isn't an exact formula or purely scientific, because if it were, many companies would, would be following the same model. A lot of their success comes down to the right product at the right time and quite a lot of luck. And often you have to go with your gut and follow your passion in order to make a business successful. What Facebook did that was smart was that they started off with a product that was niche. It was meant to be a book of, for people, a digital book for people in universities. And once they tested that market, it became successful, they expanded. Whether they thought the expansion to where it is today was where they were going is, is, is very unclear, probably not. But what starts as a humble, small idea can become quite a large idea quite quickly because you're in, you have the right product hitting the market at the right time and there's a bit of luck thrown in with quite a bit of passion. If you look at business plans, in 1968, the business plan of Intel was on one page covering three paragraphs of nine sentences each, 165 words and three errors. This company has grown since 1968 to have over 50 billion in, in revenue and 65 billion in, pre, in, in 65 million in pre-tax profits. And what this shows us is that to be entrepreneurial and innovative, you can start with very humble beginnings and build something huge. Have a go at this exercise. You're not going to get marked on it, but it's an exercise on collaboration and innovation. So let's say that you're a consultant to a network of United International Business Schools. The network of those business schools is growing quite well. And every year they're growing, but management wants to raise their academic standards. You as a consultant are asked to give them at least five major improvements focusing on academic level, course variety, teacher profiles, but also student welfare, classroom infrastructure, school locations. What would you do? What would you suggest to that school for them to raise their academic standards and become more and, and to improve, improve themselves? Your challenge is to be more creative, but also realistic. 
and focus on the real experiences at other business schools. So what are other business schools doing that this business school is not? And what would you suggest that they do in order to raise their academic standards when they focus on academic level, course variety, teacher profiles, student welfare, classroom infrastructure, and school locations? So what is a smart business model? The first is definitely to be passionate about what you're doing. Focus initially on a local market, but also look at the global opportunity. Understand who your customers are, understand your market, focus on getting your year one right, and have several exit strategies when you start. So now you have an individual assignment. What we'd like you to do is write an essay of at least 1,000 words. And the essay will focus on selecting a company that's innovated and explain in what way they've innovated. Have they innovated their product, their service, their business model? Look at the 10 ways of innovation. How has this company innovated? What innovative characteristics did it have? So what did it show? What did it do that made you know it's, it's innovating? What was the impact of that innovation? And how did their industry or market and their people react? And that brings us to the end of this module.